<laughs> Thank you, Liam. You're very kind and uh, uh, generous with your remarks, but uh, it's, I really, like every, most of us, we owe our uh, accomplishments to many others. And uh, this is my professional home, as you probably know, University of Wisconsin, where I did my graduate work, and under some very uh, wonderful people, like Fern Sumi and, and uh, Lyle Horn and, and many others. And uh, uh, much of what I have to say today is, is a result of uh, work from people here. And uh, I've only listed a few in the introduction here of people who are really doing a lot of work on this now. Chi Zhang, who uh, uh, works with me, he's from Hampton University but lives in Virginia, of course, where, where I live. And so we work very closely together. And he does all the modeling work that you're going to see today. Fantastic. And, and Anthony DeNarsa was a, a, a student of mine uh, from Hampton University who still works with me and uh, is responsible for maintaining our whole uh, satellite, direct broadcast satellite data processing system and the fusion we're going to talk about and so on. My son is involved, and uh, 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 some of his people are here from NASA, NASA Langley, who are involved in, in uh, extending the capabilities of this system and the ge geographical um, applications of this system and, and the science applications of this system. And of course, Scott Lindstrom, who introduced himself earlier, who is, uh, is our interface to the National Weather Service uh, forecasters and so on. And I want to acknowledge uh, Mitch Goldberg because this whole program started under the GOZAR um, and the uh, JPSS uh, Proving Ground and Risk Reduction Program, which Mitch headed both of those up at one time and was a supporter of the development of this. It was initially uh, to use the polar data to enhance uh, the GOES-R, which uh, wasn't going to have a sounder on it, as you know. Uh, originally it was, but then it was canceled. So in, 19, or in 2007, we started this initiative. Well, we have to uh, bring in the polar data to make GOES-R uh, capable. And that's what this uh, talk is all, all about. So thank you, Mitch. Without your uh, support, this wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, and uh, what, what I'm talking about, of course, is uh, the use of direct broadcast system from both the polar orbiters and the, uh, the GO satellites. And combining these uh, satellite data, uh, such as uh, the hyperspectral infrared sounding information we get from IASI and, uh, and, uh, and Chris, with the microwave data that we get from the MHS and AMSU on the MEDOP satellites and the ATMS on the, on the uh, SUMI NPP and the CRIS satellites and so on, to um, uh, sort of simulate the, oops, to simulate what we would get with the next generation system of hyperspectral, geo-hyperspectral data, and of course, uh, polar orbiting, uh, uh, hyperspectral and and um, microwave data. And this is just a loop, a recent one from a week or two ago, uh, which just shows over the area. Uh, NASA Langley actually produces the data with our system for the western part of the U.S. and uh, we produce the eastern part of the U.S. Uh, here at Wisconsin and at Hampton University as well. And uh, so this is what I'm going to talk about. This is water vapor, 500 um, uh, hectopascals relative humidity. It's a just 12 hour loop. But you can see how the system effectively at least simulates a sounding system from geo with very high spatial and uh, temporal resolution, spatial in all three dimensions. And uh, that's what this program is all about. And the whole idea was, uh, well, we need to optimize the uh, vertical and spatial resolution of these data from in, coming from GEO. Uh, for example, the ABI sensor has uh, very good 
uh, time and space resolution, two kilometers in space, uh, five to 15 minutes in, in time resolution, but very poor vertical resolution. Um, whereas the polar system with the IASI and Chris sensors has a very high vertical resolution, one to two kilometers, uh, but its horizontal resolution is deficient of 14 kilometers. Mitch talked about how when we get to the polar regions, re regions we start to get, you know, fairly uh, good temporal refresh because we have a lot of polar satellites in orbit. But uh, in, in our system, we can get 50 minute uh, refresh with the polar system, like from MEDOP uh, 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 A and C, they're, they're in the same orbit 50 minutes apart. And with the CRIS um, and the SNPP satellite, uh, uh, which are in the same kind of orbital configuration. But there are large gaps, seven hours or so during the day, uh, during the early morning. This is where the Chinese high rise uh, satellite comes into play, because it, it's filled that gap. And we need to get that data into the system as, as well. But uh, so we use the ABI data to fill in these uh, uh, space and, and time gaps in the hyperspectral data we get from the polar orbiters. And uh, uh, we found out that even with the ABI, with its very high resolution and so on, we still get gaps we, we below clouds. And uh, uh, that's unacceptable for a, uh, a very high resolution sounding system to improve weather forecasts, which is what our which our uh, objective is. And so we started uh, bringing in then the microwave data, the MER data from, uh, which is the uh, AMSU and, and uh, NHS on the NetOps satellites and the ATMS on the, uh, uh, on the JPSS and satellites. And so what we do is we put all this data together. And the philosophy of it is to improve forecasts, weather forecasts, particularly convective weather forecasts where you need very high space and time resolution. And so that's the objective. We already have very good forecasts from, you know, the rapid refresh uh, system. Mike mentioned this earlier and getting his fire data into that model and so on. And actually the forecasters at the uh, uh, the Storm Prediction Center and others rely on, on the RAP uh, system, and it does very well. It does extremely well in temperature, and uh, it does pretty good in moisture too, except it's low, too low a resolution. That's the only problem with RAP. It can't resolve the, the very small scale features of the water vapor, which are so important spatially and vertically for convection and the initiation of convection. So that's what we try to do with this combined system of ABI and the polar hyperspectral sounders is fill that, that uh, spatial resolution gap that's within the RAP. So our philosophy is to use the RAP, not to compete with it, but to actually use it. Uh, we use the two hour forecast, which is available at the time of the polar over, overpasses to uh, 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 vertic what we say vertically de-alias, the, uh, the, even the hyperspectral sounding, has def deficient um, vertical resolution compared to our models and the radioson and so on. It's a lot better. It's a factor of four or five better than the old filter wheel sounders, but it's still not, uh, you know, extremely high resolution. It's still one to two kilometer in vertical resolution. So, uh, we used a wrap to uh, what we say vertically de-alias our, our, uh, our retrievals with the polar sensors. And, uh, and uh, we do that in order to correct the wrap model profile errors to improve the forecast. And we use a system that's, uh, we use, for all of this, we use CSPP uh, system, processing package. Sy system, the dual regression method, which is part of uh, CSPP, and the MER, which is part of CSPP, and of course now we have a, a GEO um, uh, CSPP. And uh, so this is heavily dependent 
on the direct broadcast data uh, and the CSPP processing software. And uh, the way it works is the dual regression system uh, produces soundings down the cloud level. Uh, but uh, if there's extended cloud, it's more than thin cirrus or, or uh, 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 broken or scattered cloud, I should say, uh, it can't get good accuracy below the cloud, and that's where the microwave comes in. And, uh, and the vertical resolution, though, of the dual regression package that's within CSPP is still a relatively smooth profile, as you can see here by the green curve for temperature and dew point over here. It's compared to the radiosan. The radiosan is, are the blue and red curves. Unfortunately, the radiosans are at different times in the satellite overpass, so they don't agree perfectly. But you can see in vertical structure, when you use the RAP model to de-alias the uh, retrieval, you improve the vertical resolution, such as this uh, moisture inversion uh, uh, here in the uh, lower troposphere, or the uh, temperature. That's shown by the, the black dots is the, is the de-alias, what we call de, uh, dual regression de-alias retrieval. And we do this de-aliasing with, with, uh, with all data, with the microwave as well as the, uh, uh, the infrared hyperspectral data. And here's the rack that we start over. You can see the wrap wasn't very good. It's way too dry down here compared to what the radio sun is showing, the red curve, which is uh, closer to the time of the, uh, uh, the fusion retrieval. And uh, so that's the idea is to, and it makes a big difference when you look at the difference between the radio sun and the, uh, this is the interpolated radio sun and the and the uh, DRDA retrieval compared to just the uh, dual regression retrieval without using the model for vertically de-aliasing. Uh, it <laughs> makes improvements on the order of, of nearly 100% or, or so, depending on level and atmospheric situation. So that's a very important part of, of this system, and that's the philosophy of it. The and, step of the fusion process, what, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, oh, I wonder where that plays. I didn't, didn't you? We can maybe turn that off. Um, or I could just let it talk. <laughs> no, that's okay. Can you turn it off? Yeah, turn so, it off. Um, I think, Mitch, you had the same problem. <laughs> there we go. Well, this is, that's not it. That's the back. You get, that's a different slide. There, that's it. That's good. There yeah. You go. Okay. Thank you very much, Liam. Okay. And anyways, uh, as I usually do, I'm going a little slow here for the time given. So <laughs> I'll move along. Uh, this is a very important part of the of the uh, process of combining geo and leo uh, data. It's what we call a fusion process. And uh, 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 Elizabeth Weiss and Paul Menzel, who is here, are, are responsible for providing this um, algorithm, really, that we use uh, in our, our system to fuse together uh, both the polar uh, hyperspectral, the polar microwave, with the geo ABI data. So I thank them for that. And I won't take the time to go into the details of that, except to say that um, the idea is to take where you have, you always have coincident ABI data with the polar data, because the ABI has a very high temporal resolution. So we just take data sets where we have data at the same place in the same time, we, we uh, co-locate that data, and we geographically average the ABI data down to the resolution of the polar data. So they're comparable. So we can see in this system from this data set that's created, and we use about, uh, uh, I think it's eight hours of, of data. So we get some polar in it. It may be old, or it may be recent, but it gets in there, and it's co-located with, uh, with ABI at the same spatial resolution. And, uh, oops, 
And so we can take that co-located data set and using uh, something that uh, Elizabeth really gave her a lot of credit for uh, uh, making this work so well, is we use a KD search tree, which is very efficient, extremely fast, uh, to associate the best representation of the polar hyperspectral beta from the ABI. It's, it's sort of, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a, 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 a smart tool. It's, it's like, uh, um, a, a, like a library method, though, in this case. Uh, it can very quickly then tell you for full resolution ABI data, two kilometer resolution data, and, and ABI data at a different time where you had no polar data, what your expected hyperspectral sounding would be if you did have the hyperspectral beta at that place in time. It's not real, of course, it's predicted. It's a probability solution, uh, but it works quite well. And uh, you can see that uh, this is just a, a, a slide that shows the accuracy and yield for, I think it was last week that Anthony produced for me. Uh, which shows two things. It shows the dew point standard deviation of the air against radio sounds, and it shows the sounding yield, okay, the number of soundings over this one week period. And you can see from the standard deviation of the air, it hardly matters whether you're dealing with Chris or Chris plus ATMS uh, in this case, or Chris plus ATMS and ABI. Uh, the Chris it plus AT, all three is a little better than either the CRISP by itself, which only has soundings down to the cloud level, or uh, CRISP and ATMS, which goes below cloud down to the Earth's surface. And, uh, but what is different is the yield. You can see you get almost complete yield. This would be, if I scaled this, it would be 100%, 100% because of the CRISP and ATS, ATMS and ABI gives you soundings uh, below and in between clouds, and uh, whereas the CRIS only gets you down to cloud level, so you see the yield drop off as you get near the surface below clouds, especially extended clouds. And, uh, that's the blue curve, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, this is CRIS and ATMS. So the standard deviation of the differences due to uh, satellite observation radius on time differences are not that much different for the uh, CRIS by itself, or CRIS plus ATMS, and CRIS plus ATMS and ABI when you compare it to radio sounds uh, in terms of dew point. And, but the yield is, of course, quite different, and that's what it's all about, is to get uh, nearly full coverage. And so this is our eastern sector, which is produced here at Wisconsin at, at Langley, which shows uh, what we call the, uh, 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 the uh, polar satellite coverage. This is over the seven hour, a seven hour period, four to seven, four to seven UTC in, on this particular day. This one is the polar plus ABI, which is shown here. And this is the polar plus microwave plus ABI as shown here. Although this is something, a product we put out where, where we don't have polar sounders or don't have satellite soundings, we fill it in with RAT model data because that's the best estimate we have if we don't have the satellite data. So this on the bottom shows exactly what we're trying to deduce, which is the difference between the satellite product and the RAT model. And, um, and uh, you can see here that um, uh, there's gaps. If you just had polar data, big gaps in data because of clouds. Uh, if you, if you uh, even bring in the ABI data, it gives you a lot more spatial resolution, fills in some gaps, but where you have extended cloud, you still have, have gaps. And uh, when you put them together and so on, then you, you, it fills in uh, these areas of uh, very um, fine scale water vapor information, important for severe weather, like these dry lines here, this dry air down here and so on that you wouldn't have if you uh, uh, didn't do this uh, fusion process. And then, and then we take that data and we, we that data only gives us temperature and, and uh, moisture profiles, but we need winds for forecasting. You gotta have 
wind information. You need dynamics. That's a very important part of the forecast system. And so we diagnose the winds by assimilating continuously and with high frequency the thermodynamic data coming from the uh, PHS and ABI and microwave data. Uh, and we do this in two models. We do a 60 minute interval assimilation when we're producing RAP resolution forecasts and we do a 30 minute interval assimilation when we're doing uh, HER, the high resolution rapid refresh model forecast with these data. And uh, we did that continuously assimilation and used the forecast model primitive equations of motion to tell us what the what the, what the wind distribution has to be uh, as um, uh, forced, if you like, by this rapid and continuous assimilation of, of moisture profile data in particular. And that forces the model then to produce, after a three hour period, uh, winds which conform pretty well to real three dimensional wind structure. Then we use the, both the temperature and moisture observations with those wind profile observations that we forced by continuous assimilation to initialize a forecast model. And that using temperature, moisture, and winds provided by the high resolution sounding data, uh, we show that it improves the, uh, uh, the forecast that, if, that you get if you don't use the satellite data. And that's shown here by these two curves. Where red, this is temperature, this is humidity, this is wind velocity. The red uh, is uh, when you assimilate the satellite data, as I just described, into the model. And the blue is the control. This is what happens if you don't. You assimilate all the operational weather data, uh, everything the RAP has in it, and so on. In fact, we use the RAP to initialize the, the whole assimilation process. And you see that the High, high resolution, high temporal and spatial resolution satellite sounding data does indeed improve the forecast. And it also improves the uh, convection forecasts. Uh, and you can see this in, in validations we do statistically uh, uh, day in and day out against uh, you know, the RAP and the HER with the uh, forecasts that are produced with the uh, with the, uh, this PHS and microwave and ABI data. And uh, this is a, a, a case for the New York City flash flood incident, which you may remember, which happened last year on September 21st. There were quite a few people that died in this flash flood situation. And what you're looking at is the observed rainfall from radar and uh, uh, surface observations that are put out by NOAA in the, what they call the stage four uh, forecast. And that which we predicted um, with our three kilometer and uh, eight kilometer, I'm sorry, uh, three kilometer and, and uh, I'm sorry, the left is, uh, <laughs> is the uh, eight, eight uh, no, that's right, that's the three kilometer um, I'm getting confused myself. This is a three kilometer satellite forecast. This is the uh, three kilometer uh, HER forecast. That's the operational NOAA forecast. And these are the maximum rainfall intensities uh, in, in this, uh, uh, these forecasts. I think they were eight hour forecasts. Yeah, eight hour forecasts. And on the bottom is that lower resolution, the RAP model, which isn't as good in either RAP versus HER or in uh, in our forecast, satellite data versus her. The, so the higher resolution satellite data and the higher resolution forecast model makes a big difference in the um, uh, ability to forecast convective weather and um, uh, with high accuracy and high resolution. And um, there are many, many cases that demonstrate this and statistics show this as well, as I said. And then thanks to uh, uh, Scott Lindstrom, who's here, uh, and is giving a talk, I think, tomorrow. Um, Scott, Scott is here, right? Yep, okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Scott. He's a very important uh, interface to real, real forecasters who can use this data. And uh, um, he also writes blogs on cases, immunological cases, and so on. 
And Scott has shown how you can use the cape that's produced by the forecast model to predict where severe storms are going to develop. This is, happens to be for uh, April 12th of this year. It was a tornado outbreak in northern, um, northwest Iowa, I think it was. And uh, you can see how the, these storms usually form where you have the strongest gradient of cape. And you can see this nose of strong gradient cape going right up into the uh, northern uh, Iowa, northwestern Iowa area right in here where these convective storms took place. And then we also, uh, we also uh, uh, can predict, use what we call a satellite tornado parameter to predict where tornadic storms are going to take place. And we do that, that's a combination of stability and helicity and uh, uh, vertical wind shear and, and so on. Uh, combined together, it's a very uh, efficient tool for, for putting out outlooks for where uh, tornadoes can occur. And this is what our, our forecasts uh, produced for the, uh, that particular case, this is saturated. The STP is so high here, it saturated our scale, went off scale here. But uh, you can see that high STP areas in Northern Iowa, where um, these are uh, surface storm reports that uh, uh, are put out by SPC for this period. Again, thank you, uh, Scott, and I think Brad Pierce recently uh, use these products that Scott uh, developed into uh, a, a presentation to our administrator, Rick Spinrad, uh, last week. So I used those. Scott also provided, uh, we, we participated in HWT the last four weeks. It ended on Friday. And so these data were going to, uh, I don't know, I'm missing a slide, but it doesn't matter. Um, these data were going to um, um, uh, forecasters, uh, NOAA, uh, mainly WFO forecasters, who were using this data to evaluate um, its operational uh, utility. And um, so things like the uh, PHS CAPE and the PHS uh, Tornado STP and uh, other uh, sounding information coming with, with these systems were given to forecasters participating in the hazardous weather testbed experiment to evaluate its operational utility. And they had a lot of nice uh, things to say about it, uh, fortunately. And I just highlighted a, a, a number of, of things here. This one I think is the most important is that the forecaster said the PHS CAPE forecasts appeared to be a noteworthy improvement from the Cape fields on the SPC, the Storm Predicting, Prediction Center, mesoanalysis. And this mesoanalysis, which uses RAP data plus surface data and so on to produce these products, is really what the uh, WFO forecasters use now. And he's noting a significant improvement in that provided by this system. Another forecaster said, I found the PHS products useful for seeing the corridors of enhanced uh, severe risks, like the example that I sh just showed a moment ago, and correctly showed that hail and wind was the highest risk compared to tornadoes, and that was because of our STP values, uh, they, the, the way they were uh, somewhat lower for this region in this case, showing that tornadoes won't occur. And uh, I will quit now. <laughs> and uh, anyways, uh, another forecaster just said, after overlying uh, Prob Severe, which is another product that uh, originates here, that's a very good one, and uh, 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 it says, after observing uh, overlaying Prob Severe with PHS Cape and visible uh, satellite imagery, you can see your strongest storms along the Cape gradient, which tracks well. And so, they had a lot of nice things to say about uh, the use of these data. Uh, and they showed me something that was uh, I didn't realize until uh, HWT, and that was that the short-term forecasts are very important. They use it for now casting because it takes a couple hours to get these data processed and put in a model and, and to generate the forecast model 
but it's not real time. It's about two hours old uh, by the time uh, a user can see these products. So they use the two hour forecast because that's real time, that's now. They can use that with uh, real time radar, real time lightning data and so on to, uh, uh, for situation awareness and to uh, uh, predict the severity of, of expected severe weather and to put out warnings to the public. And uh, anyways, this is my summary and conclusions. I'll, I'll uh, end very quickly here, and that is that the PHS and that microwave and that ABI observations, as I've shown, serves as a proxy for next generation polar and geohyperspectral sounding data. Very important for uh, our uh, not only getting the support of, of uh, for the development of these systems, but also for knowing how to apply data coming from our next generation systems for improving forecasts. They significantly improve temperature, moisture, and wind observations, which improve forecasts of precipitation and severe weather, including tornadoes. The now casting capability of short term two to three hour forecasts initialized through the assimilation of the PHS and ABIs uh, soundings was demonstrated during the 2002 NOAA hazardous weather test bed. And uh, this last statement is just where we plan to go from here, which is to enhance the geographical coverage of this capability. And as I said earlier, NASA Langley is in, involved in this. Uh, for other reasons than severe weather prediction, it's, it's more interested in, uh, I think, in clouds and radiation and aviation forecasts and things of that nature. Uh, but we're going to expand the geo cover geographical coverage if we get the resources to do it. We need money and we need uh, more time, more nodes on the S4 supercomputer here at Wisconsin to actually do this. So um, I'm uh, appealing for that kind of support. But we'll, we'll include the entire CONUS region in this system. Uh, in preparation for data to come from our U.S. next generation uh, geostationary and polar orbiting satellite system. So with that, I'll conclude. I hope I didn't go over too much. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Do we have a question for Bill? Yes. Can you speak louder? I'm hard of hearing it. Sorry. No bad. <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully this isn't too far off scope. Oh, and this is great. This is really fascinating. But are there, are there any plans or like, any thoughts in place about trying to apply this in cases where you don't have a mesoscale model like the RAP, or say using a hurricane forecast or using a model of hurricanes in case this could expand to uh, yeah, right. I think it relates to your question here. Yes, that, that's uh, we're we are using we are converting our system to uh, uh, the unified uh, forecast system. Is that what you were asking? Is so you said you're, you're adapting your system so yeah. it works with the unified forecast system. system. Yeah. Okay. So it's consistent with uh, with uh, you know the next generation uh, for forecast system here in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Bill, just briefly, you mentioned that you're using IASI and CRIS data, well, IASI, AMSU, MHS, CRIS, and ATMS data from direct broadcast. Yes. Where and how do you get that data from? Get it from you. <laughs> well, what does that mean exactly? I mean, I mean we get it. We uh, well, we get it from a number of sources, and we have backups to this and that uh, for all of these data sets. So, our for the satellite data, uh, Wisconsin is our uh, our primary uh, source. But if Wisconsin is down for some reason and so on, then we go directly to the direct broadcast systems to uh, uh, get this data. And uh, if that's down, we, we uh, go to AWS, the Amazon Web Services uh, NOAA sites, to uh, 
uh, try to get the, these data. And that's the same way with computer systems. We have computer systems backed up. We got the primary system is the S4. The primary model is the three kilometer resolution model. But if that system is down, like it was actually last uh, Thursday, I think it was, uh, then we go to Hampton U. We're running, we run that system there so we can back up, but we only run the eight kilometer resolution there because they don't have the, the computer power of the, of the S4. And uh, uh, we also uh, uh, can do some of this processing on the AWS, the Amazon Web Services, but that's not fully implemented yet. So just in terms of the direct readout data, you're getting data from the station at Hampton University, which you were in Oh, I'm sorry. Did that show up? up? I think it's, it's just the first slide, I think. Yeah, uh, I think we saw it. Yeah, you also okay. get it from the direct readout site. In right. We, we use right now, okay. uh, we use Miami, place. we use Hampton, we use uh, Wisconsin, and, and we use Monterey. Those are our, the direct broadcast sites. In the future, we'll be using, of course, Fairbanks, and we'll be using Honolulu. And uh, 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 probably maybe Marigas too, uh, if, if need be. We can use them all, but uh, those right. are the primary broadcast sites. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Oh, no, no problem. Thanks very much, Bill.